I promised you would start right at 10 o'clock, and it's 10.01 already. Time slips by. So um, I just want to give you a, a real quick heads up on this morning's session. Thank you all first for coming. Um, this is the Small Farmer um, mini conference part of uh, the expo, and we started doing this a couple years ago with the idea that um, oftentimes kind of the needs and the interests of folks that are, that are smaller uh, farmers, uh, maybe those that are uh, getting into direct marketing, um, I kind of term you all food entrepreneurs sometimes, that you all have uh, more specialized needs perhaps than some of the other programs would address. And so um, a couple years ago we started this and we're kind of continuing it. Um, as you might recall last year we were upstairs where it was a whole lot more noisy, um, kind of hard to sometimes to follow all that was going on. Um, this year, I want to give uh, thanks to Jennifer Boyles, who's sitting back there at the registration table. Thank you, Jennifer. And Matt Smith, who's over here. And hey. Diana Voss Frank for all helping to put this program together for you today. So if we give them a quick hand, please. Uh, my name's Dave Lamy. I work for Clemson University. I'm out of the Institute for Economic and Community Development at the Sand Hill Research Station. Um, I run the South Carolina New and Beginning Farmer Program and some other things. I know many of you in the room, but not all. This is going to be um, a, a really pretty quick-paced day. Uh, it's going to be a day where I would otherwise hope we would have a lot of kind of give-and-take interaction. But quite frankly, in this setting and given the limited amount of time we have and the amount of information that we want to load you up with, it's mainly going to be kind of coming at you all. Um, if we can sneak in a question here or there, we'll, we'll try to do that uh, from the floor. Um, but there's not really, honestly, going to be a lot of opportunity for that. So um, we don't want you to be frustrated by that, even though you might be. Um, treat this day as a way to kind of learn what's going on, see who the people are that you need to follow up with after uh, this session is over and uh, definitely do that. That's the purpose, is to make you generally aware of a lot of things that are going on that can be supportive to you and your business. So to get this thing started right away, um, I've invited uh, a friend of mine and a, and a colleague, a uh, USDA colleague, uh, Debbie Tropp from Washington, D.C., to come in and deliver a, a keynote talk. And I'm going to let her make further introductions of uh, how she's placed within the USDA matrix and <laughs> carry on. Thanks so much, Dave. I like the idea of thinking about a USDA matrix. It reminds me of the movie. There might be some similarities there. Who knows? Um, anyhow, as, as Dave said, I am Debbie Tropp. I am the branch chief for farmers markets and direct farm marketing at USDA. And that's a position I've had for close to 11 years. I've spent 22 years at the department, all of it within the agricultural marketing service, uh, transportation and marketing programs. What I hope to do today is following some, from some of the themes we heard from the commissioner and uh, from Clemson already about looking at the future. And what I hope I give you today will give you something to digest and think about how is the future of agriculture unfolding, especially for small and mid-sized farms. So with no further ado, I'm going to jump right in. Um, the, my talk is entitled, Why Local Food Matters, Views from the National Landscape. And let's turn to the table of contents. Next slide. Oh, thank you. OK, so just very briefly, here's what we are going to go over today. We'll talk a little bit about why I and my program and USD in general is connected to this issue. Uh, what is the changing paradigm of US agriculture? Things we're going to talk about here is what's changing on the buyer side, the commercial buyer side, and the consumer side in terms of their perceptions and needs. And how is that leading to the formation of value chains and how do they differ from the traditional supply chain? We're also going to look at the importance of local food demand. And what is it about local food that actually meets buyer and consumers evolving needs? And we'll talk a bit about what the future of local food like, looks like and what are some of the drivers uh, that can influence future growth. Uh, we also, at the very end, to, as time allows, um, I'll talk a little bit about our programs. Uh, I work on the research and technical assistance side. I will share some information about the grant side of our house. Uh, won't go into great detail, but hopefully that'll be interest to you. And if I don't get to much of it, happy to share with you afterwards. Okay. So let's talk about our legislative authority for just a second. 
You know, when you hear about local food, I suspect many of you think that local food is a new issue on the scene and that direct farm marketing, farmers markets are a fairly new issue on the farm scene. But in actuality at USDA, this is something we've been working on for a very long time. It's actually embedded in our legislative authority. If you look at the 1946 Agricultural Marketing Act, uh, our mandate is to reduce the price spread between producers and consumers. We're also directed to support the full uh, production of American agriculture, regardless of scale, uh, to improve nutrition and quality standards. And in 1976, the Farmer to Consumer Direct Marketing Act very specifically mandated that we focus on direct marketing and farmers markets and uh, direct to consumer types of trade. So this is something we've been doing for already for many decades. Next. Um, we have a couple of different mission areas within my program. Uh, one of them is on the direct marketing area, farmers markets and direct to consumer marketing. Uh, we collect data, we manage. Some of you may be familiar with the National Directory of Farmers Markets. Hands, anybody have heard of that in this room? All right, Dave has heard of it, fortunately. We'll get the rest of you to learn about it too. You might find it useful. Um, beyond that, uh, we also do a lot of work on food aggregation. Uh, next one. Um, some of you may have heard the term food hubs. We've been looking in recent years at aggregation models to help producers scale up and take advantage of local food demand. Uh, we also have a certified architect on staff who uh, works with local architects to help with facility design for food markets and food warehouse facilities. Okay, let's move on. So, what is our focus in our program and what is our focus today? Well, there's been a lot of changes going on that really help explain some of the phenomena you see going on in agricultural marketing. With technology, we're seeing real-time exchange of information, and that allows for greater responsiveness across the supply chain. We're seeing that customers are no longer content with one-size-fits-all solutions. They don't just go to supermarkets anymore. They go up to a variety of stores to get their food. That includes the farmers markets of the world and the CSAs. We're noticing that they're willing to go to multiple sources for different kinds of food. They may buy their perishable products at a different place than they buy their non-perishables, for example. And we also are noticing that increasingly many customers want to use the power of their pocketbook to influence broader social and environmental goals. So where does that take us? Looking briefly at our recent past, what we used to have in ag across the board was more of a competitive structure really no room for cooperation, lots of suppliers and lots of sellers and lots of anonymous transactions. And buyers weren't particularly open to cooperation. They were very price oriented. They didn't have any incentive to cooperate. Um, producers were more captive suppliers. And very little, you know, technology was crude and we can call this an anticipatory supply chain, trying to project what was happening, where demand was going. Next. Where we see this evolving right now is to a more cooperative supply chain. And we may even want to call it a value chain because there's vested interests from producers, suppliers, processors, all working towards the same goals. Why? Because it could mean steadier pricing, greater consistent supply availability, greater quality control, more precise inventory management, and more rapid responsiveness to shifting customer needs. So a lot of the cultural divide that has separated buyers and, and producers for such a long time is starting to shrink. And price is no longer the complete driver anymore. We're talking about longer term contracts uh, instead of dealing with a market that is all about short-term price fluctuations. And technology has certainly played a role in making that possible because of the ability to monitor market conditions in real time. So let's call today's supply chain more responsive. 
and it's giving rise to what we like to call a value chain relationship in the food system rather than the more traditional fragmented supply chain. So let's talk about that. What is a food value chain? Well, we like to think of it as an innovative business model in which producers and buyers and other supply chain participants come together and form collaborative partnerships. And as we talked about before, we, they all believe that they can uh, achieve greater financial return and benefit from this level of cooperation. Uh, next. In some ways, it may look a lot like it may look a lot like a traditional supply chain, but it's based on shared sense of social mission. So let's say a group gets together and they want to have shared principles about animal welfare or about certain types of sustainable uh, agricultural practices. They also have shared operational values in terms of how do they exchange information from point of sale to the producer in terms of how do they come together for joint planning of planting intentions of price negotiation so there is a lot of integration and a lot of shared experience along the way next slide please we basically have taken a concept that has been popularized at harvard, harvard business school by professor michael porter who talks about this a lot in manufacturing and been looking at this with case studies against the food system and we think there's a lot of similarity that can be applied when it comes to agricultural marketing. Um, as Porter points out, businesses intentionally structure their core operations in, in value chains to produce both financial success and social benefit. Now traditionally businesses They'll come up with a value proposition. What is it that's kind of the driver and a determinant of value um, for customers? It's usually based on describing how a firm's products and services are superior. But with food value chains, we add another dimension and we're capturing new kinds of demand. And we're saying beyond that, beyond superiority, is our product good for our customers? If they buy our product, do they feel better about their purchase? Because they think they're making a difference to their community, to their environment, to the social betterment. And that is an integral part of these new business transactions. How do producers benefit from these new arrangements? Well, for one thing, they tend to give producers a lot more negotiating power when it comes to price. Because here you don't have just a commodity you have a valued, highly differentiated food item that commercial buyers want and their customers want, and they're willing to pay more to get it in the volume and at the time that they need it, and have the ability to tell the producer's story, to provide the level of authenticity that consumers are hankering for. They also have the ability to respond more quickly to these customer needs. And as we already explored, customers' needs are evolving and shifting and becoming more discriminating so that you have to really keep your eye on the ball if you want to stay ahead. So value chains permit that exchange of information across the chain that is becoming ever more important when it comes to successful food marketing. Let's skip ahead to, to the first picture. Here we go. So this is a, an Intervale food hub in Burlington, Vermont. Some of the producers found that um, they were able, instead of getting your typical uh, percentage of the food dollar, say, for produce, maybe a quarter of the final uh, consumer food expenditure, uh, they were able to get something between 70 and 85% of the um, final uh, price uh, by working together. and. Uh, this is most of the stuff at Intervale has is a workplace CSA. Um, they basically do deliveries, weekly deliveries uh, during multiple seasons to major hospitals and insurance companies in in the Burlington, Vermont area. Next, please. 
In this case, um, and I have a couple of books and we have, uh, we can talk about later, where we go through these case studies in detail. Uh, this is a case of country natural beef in Oregon. One of the things here is they require the producers that are a member of this value chain to do sampling in-house in, in, in supermarkets that buy this product in order to improve their exposure to customers and to get uh, improve customer loyalty to buying country national be natural beef and give customers the opportunity to ask questions from the producers themselves. And so, again, uh, arrangements that allow for that kind of personal relationship are, are really key and really give the small and mid-sized farmer, I think, an edge in, in the market. Next. Okay, let's talk a bit about how consumer perspectives are changing. Um, I extracted this information from Phil Lampert, who is a very well-known pundit in the food industry. And this is from a 2013 report that he compiled. He says, more shoppers are interested in knowing not only where their food is coming from, but they, they want to know about the people making their food. They want to learn about their stories. They want to they spend more time reading labels on the food packages. They're looking for authenticity, transparency, heritage. They're returning to roots with antibiotic-free and free-range and artisanal and original recipes. So who best to make that happen, to meet those needs, than the small producer that can stand behind their product and knows their product, and it's part of, their, of your marketing arena to be able to make those personal connections. Next. Lambert continues, people are choosing their foods more holistically, not just based on one factor or two, but a whole range of factors that in many ways they see embedded in the local idea. It's taste and freshness, ingredients, best ingredients, where it comes from, nutritional composition, the ability to ask who made their foods and how they were made, and understanding their impact on the environment and animal welfare. One thing you should keep in mind is, at the same time this is happening, this is not just what's happening in you know, a niche segment of the consumer uh, market, but actually is a very mainstream phenomenon. Uh, what we've seen in the past two decades is a very steep decline in uh, shoppers' use of traditional supermarkets. In 1994, 81% of U.S. grocery retail sales, now that just covers uh, consumables and perishables, were made at traditional supermarket format stores. That had dropped to 52% by 2004. It's believed to have dropped to only 40% by 2013 and is projected to drop further to 37% in the next five years. That's kind of an amazing statement. And so what that tells me is, you know, people are looking to buy different products in different places. The next, oh, thank you. The strongest growth where this is happening, what we're seeing in the store formats, is in the, what they call a fresh format store. Fresh format store, examples listed here, Whole Foods, Fresh Market. I'm sure many of you have been to them and have, are familiar with them. They emphasize perishables, really perishables pretty much are the, the, the center store attraction for these retailers. They also tend to offer an unusual degree of ethnic, natural, and organic foods, uh, even if they have a smaller number of SKUs overall. Very briefly, this just shows you different formats. This does not include, by the way, direct-to-consumer outlets. This is strictly retail stores. You can see the changes in traditional supermarket and a little bit of a pickup in fresh format and you know kind of um, you know things have stayed pretty much or expected pretty much the same between now and 2018 in some of the other formats so Go ahead. very quickly this just shows um, this is from a few years back but I still think it's very telling because I suspect this is even a greater phenomenon than it was in this chart you'll see here under farmers markets that it was only a primary food source for 1% of consumers in this particular panel, but it was a secondary 
it was the secondary food uh, source for fresh produce for 25 percent. And I think that we need to keep in mind that, you know, there's a real interest and probably a lot of untapped demand for finding direct marketing opportunities or local food in markets that may be not fully exercised yet. Um, and as you can see, the percentage of fresh produce sold through supermarkets uh, may be a primary source when that's what they wanted, but when they have a choice, primary source of fresh produce, barely a majority, and on the way down. And secondary source of fresh produce, you know, very modest. So there's a lot of diversity in where people are finding their produce and where they're trying to find these highly differentiated food products. So, with all that, how does this fit into local food? Well, I think you're getting the picture that I'm trying to explain to you. If there's anything I want you to take away from this talk is that local's really not just about geography. I think we get very hung up on like, well, local, isn't that like a 100 mile radius or 400 miles or what have you, or in the state? Well, to some degree, yes. But local in many ways is operating as a proxy for consumers. It's operating as a proxy for personal relationship. We heard from the commissioner this morning the importance of relationship. I think what we're seeing here is a real hungering among many consumers for the customer service they no longer get anymore. And they're particularly concerned when it comes to food that they take into their bodies and we've got an, uh, an aging population that's going to be more and more concerned about what they eat and the quality of what they eat. The idea of knowing where their food comes from becomes increasingly important and that's where you all fit in and that's where you make a difference and that's where you can benefit financially. Um, let's go ahead. Let's keep on going actually. Um, I want to point out that if you look at it overall, local food sales, still very, very small. Okay. 10? Okay. Good. All right. <laughs> um, I was going to say it's still a very small percentage of what's purchased, but it, there's a lot of variation regionally and, and very, variation across commodity mixes, so it's very important to understand those changes. Next. Um, we have a problem with data a little bit at USDA. Until recently, the census of agriculture has only been capturing one small bit of the local food market. Uh, it is directly marketed edible food products for human consumption. So kind of a complicated uh, way of stating it. Uh, but that portion grew threefold between 1992 and 2007. Um, well, there was a little bit of an uptick additionally in, in 2012, which is the latest census. So you can see that that's a very rapid change. And it's even more striking. Okay. Totally, though, local food sales, if you think about, if you take into consideration food that was grown locally, that was sold locally through intermediaries, uh, the estimate in 2008 was that we're talking nearly a $5 billion uh, market. Next. And I just want to point out that even the statistics we have that are a little bit dated, that, you know, even just looking at the direct-to-consumer portion of it, which is the smaller portion, we've seen very rapid growth in certain areas of the country. And that, to me, suggests that, you know, um, a place like the Southeast, which may not have been as aggressive so far in seeing the increase in local food demand as the far west or the northeast, the coast, you know, maybe it hasn't been fully realized here. So it's something to think about. How far can it go? Next. Some of, the, some of the factors that contribute to strengthen local food sales have to do with geographic proximity to farms, population density, um, you know, vegetable, fruit, and nut farms dominate local food sales. Uh, and, you know, metropolitan areas, so far it's been geographically concentrated in the Northeast and the West Coast. Next slide. But, and these are some of the top states where we've seen the most aggressive growth in recent years. Next. But 
you know, again, this is a national phenomenon and not restricted to those areas because as we're going to see sh shortly, um, it, it strikes, it com comes across all income groups. Next. Just to give you a very quick overview, this is a chart from when we started our national farmers market directory in 94 till now and you can see that it moved from about 1750 markets in 94 that we learned about till uh, 8300 approximately today. So that also just shows you the real strength and vigor of this sector. Oh, no. um, go ahead. This is interesting. Um, not only are consumers interested in buying products, but this is, this is taken from the National Restaurant Association 2014 industry forecast. Approximately 70% of restaurant operators surveyed said their customers are more interested in locally sourced items than they were two years ago. And that's 90% when you're talking about fine dining restaurants. 81% um, of consumers also said they are trying to eat healthier at restaurants now than they did two years ago. Next. Um, top menu trends for 2015. The ones in bold all have to do with local food. Take a look. Number one, locally sourced meats and seafood, locally grown produce, environmental sustainability. All the way down to 10, farm estate branded items. This may not be happening in your neighborhood today, but look to it to come to your neighborhood three years or five years from now. Um, on the grocery side, a combined 87% of grocery shoppers, household shoppers, surveyed by the National Grocery Association 2013 said that local is very important or somewhat important to their choice of grocery store. This is up slightly from previous levels and it's uh, nearly at the peak. Uh, most important, the second bullet. Leading the key important component are Hispanics. Not necessarily what you might think of intuitively, except if you know how people in Mexico and Central America buy product, you might realize that makes a lot of sense. How do they use fruits and vegetables and do they do a lot of scratch cooking? Um, next. Really key. Low prices at grocery stores don't even make it into the top 10 considerations of grocery shoppers when looking for food. For the first time in recent memory, less than half of consumers said items on sale or money saving specials are very important. The two lowest income groups drove this measure. Now, that's not saying price isn't important. We're just saying that price isn't the only thing in town, and I think that's a big takeaway from the talk today. I'm almost done. <laughs> um, keep on going. This is a, from a, from a AT Kearney analysis from 2013. Shoppers across all segments willing to pay more for local. Are you willing to pay more for local? Okay, single urban households, 95%, no big surprise. Let's go down the list. Low income families, a majority. Senior citizens, two thirds. Again, what are we picking up here? This is real, this isn't a fad. This to me is also very interesting. Who do you trust? Highest trust, farmer's market. Closer the relationship, the better the trust. No surprise there. How can you take advantage of that? Skip. Uh, I think I'm going, to, I'm going to cut out some of this. Um, what I think I'm going to do is turn to you right now is the grants at the back just to give a quick overview because we're rushed for time. All right. The, um, oh, sorry, okay. The first one I think is on a uh, farmer's market. Yeah, this is good. That, 
Next one. Okay. Just before I promised you, I'm running a little over. Um, I apologize. I, I had thought I had 45 minutes, and I understood this morning I had 30. So, <laughs> uh, apologize for uh, my cutting, uh, skipping pieces. Um, I want to give you a quick overview of some of the pr resources that are available from my agency that can help you and your colleagues take advantage of some of these opportunities. Um, go next. One, I have a few fact sheets on this if anyone is interested afterwards, and I can always send it to the, you after the fact. Um, another part of AMS, the Specialty Crop Inspection Program, is currently working on a pilot project for a GRAP certification for small producer groups. Uh, we have uh, about half a dozen entities currently involved. Uh, we're testing the feasibility with the idea that AMS hopes to roll out an official group certification program by 2016. Very exciting. Would really lower the cost of compliance. And so we'll keep you posted as this rolls along. But um, anyone who's interested in that, let me know, and I can at least send you a fact sheet about what's going on right now. Next. Farmers Market Promotion Program. How many people in here know about this? This has been around since uh, 2006. Um, very, very diverse uh, applicant eligibility. Uh, the only people that cannot apply, individual producers and uh, state governments practically, uh, but uh, producer networks certainly are encouraged to apply. Uh, and this is to support and facilitate the growth of direct marketing opportunities. Next, we have local food promotion program just funded by the last farm bill. Uh, we just getting the, some of the results from our first round of grants last year. Um, this is for local food that is sold through intermediaries, such as aggregators, food hubs, cooperatives, and the like. Um, and we expect the RFA for this program and for the Farmer's Market Program to go out in March. Uh, there is also the Specialty Crop Block Grant Program. Probably people here from the State Department of Ag can tell you a little bit more about how to apply in your state. AMS provides uh, uh, oversight and administration of this program, but the states actually run their own mini-grant programs and allocate the funds themselves based on state priorities. These are for specialty crops here defined as fruits, vegetables, tree nuts, dried fruits, horticulture, and nursery crops. Next. Federal State Marketing Improvement Program. This is a, a program that uh, goes to state agencies and experiment stations for market research projects, about 1.3 million a year. And uh, often many land grant universities participate in these. Okay. And then AMS, another part of my agency, the National Organic Program runs the cost share program for organic certification. I did see that Clemson has some good information about organic certification out on their table today. So you can learn about that. And then my contact information. I have a few reports about value chains with me if people are interested. I have a handful. If I run out, I'd love to take your business card and get you anything you'd like. Uh, Dave has a copy of this presentation, and you may have ways of getting it to people. Um, I'm happy to send it as well. Um, I thank you for your time. I'm sorry I couldn't take questions. I'm happy to take them afterwards. And thank you again for being here.